It's time for Paleo Radio, only on Secular Media Network. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Welcome to episode 43 of Paleo Radio, live in studio here in WPRR, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM. Again, this is a live show, so you guys can call in, 616-656-1680. We've got a great lineup for you guys. First episode or first segment we're going to get into is the EpiPen price increase by Milan. Next is going to be Italy earthquake, almost 300 dead and a whole entire city flattened. Uh, more details following that. Really just a devastating thing that happened in Italy this week. Third segment, exploring the aquatic ape theory. This is just one of my little pet ones. I love this one. Um, Elaine Morgan, who has written extensively. She's a, wealth, a Welsh writer. Uh, she's written extensively about uh, aquatic ape theory, and she had a TED Talk segment that I think was interesting I wanted to share with you folks. And the last segment is going to be Turkey invades Syria and Kurdish forces stay to fight Turkey um, and just the history behind that, which is a really, really interesting development in the war in Syria that's gone on in the past week. First segment is cost of the EpiPen. One senator's daughter in is the Milan CEO. Another needs the drug. This is a CNN article by Eugene Scott. The incredible increase in the cost of EpiPens, auto injectors that can stop life-threatening emergencies caused by allergic reactions, has hit home on Capitol Hill. One Democratic senator whose daughter has allergies has called for the action in another Democratic senator's daughter is the CEO of the company, and she is responsible for the price hike. Senator Joe Manchin said Thursday, Milan, the company which manufactures EpiPens, which is headed by his daughter, is responding to the constituency and the lawmakers' questions. Quote, I'm aware of the questions my colleagues and my parents are asking, and frankly, I share their concerns about the skyrocketing prices of prescription drugs, the West Virginia Democrat said in a statement. Today, I heard Milan's initial response, and I'm sure that Milan will have more comprehensive and formal responses to those questions. So this is an interesting scenario. We have a political figure who knows or, or political figures who know and use EpiPens or use them themselves. And there also is a sitting senator who's a Democrat, mind you, Joe Manchin, whose daughter is involved in the price hike. And this stuff is just it's like reality TV or old school soap operas. You really just can't make it up. Manchin's daughter, Heather Bresch, who is Milan's CEO, CEO, announced Thursday that the company is taking steps to make the product more affordable, including providing $300 in savings cards to cut the price in half, though she told CNBC the healthcare system needed to be fixed. Um, we have a video of her on uh, CNBC explaining this on Squawk Box. A pretty interesting one, um, if we can play that. Clip. First, uh, as I put out today, just to try to help, because I know this is a complicated conversation around health care and insurance, that the $600 is a list price, that 608 is a list price. What Mylan takes from that, our net sales is 274 so $137 per pen. And against that, manufacturing the product, distributing the product, enhancing the product, investing. When we took over this product eight years ago, there was very, very little awareness. We took on, we have doubled the lives of patients that are carrying an EpiPen. We have passed legislation in 48 states to allow undesignated EpiPens to be in schools. And what that means, there have been unfortunate, tragic events, like a seven-year-old in Virginia who died on the schoolyard because the school had EpiPens, but not in her name. So we fought. That takes time and resources to get out there and make sure that people are aware of the issues and that people understand that EpiPens need to be everywhere. I said it's just like a defibrillator. When you need, when you need, when you are having a severe allergic reaction, you need EpiPen in seconds. But surely, Heather, surely you must understand the outrage. As somebody I talked to last night said, people are outraged because it seems outrageous that the American Medical Association has said, this is basically the same product it was in 2009, and yet the price has gone up three or four hundred fold. So, the fr- look, no one's more frustrated than me. I've been in but this you're business ra- you're for 25 years. You're the one raising the price, though. How can you be frustrated? 
my frustration is there's a list price of 608. There is a system. There are, I laid out that there are four or five hands that the product touches and companies that it goes through before it ever gets to that patient at the counter. No one, everybody should be frustrated. I am hoping that this is an inflection point for this country. Our health care is in a crisis. It's no different than the mortgage financial crisis back in 2007. This bubble is going to burst. What bubble? What are you referring to? So when you walk up to a counter, I think that it's fair to say anytime you're shopping for anything, you know what that product's going to cost when you walk up to the counter. Only in health care, and in this instance pharmaceuticals, do you walk up to that pharmacy counter, you could have paid $25 yesterday, and you're paying $600, $1,000, $2,000. Deductibles went overnight. What's coming out of a patient's pocket went yeah. from $100 to $3,000. And all they know is, and listen, let's be fair, you know this. I mean, mom and pop, when they go to a Walgreen or a CVS, and they have to punk down 500 600 bucks for an EpiPen, and they see myelin on it, do they care about all those other people making the cut? No, they don't. And, and they shouldn't care. So there you have uh, Heather Bresch again on uh, CNBC Squawk Box just talking about the price increase of EpiPens. And uh, she is the CEO of Mylan, by the way. And she's talking about the consistent price increase. And we've heard this firsthand from her that this is a product that everyone must have. And it's also a product that they need to make money on. And maybe that's the problem with applying a capitalistic structure to healthcare. Options are limited in the first place. It's not like someone who has a major allergic reaction to bees can go without EpiPens in the summer. Or someone who's deathly allergic to peanuts can't have one of them. They must have one of them at all times. The healthcare system isn't a market where you can just drop producing products that are cheap but save lives if they don't hit price goals. I think they should look at it in a more dynamic sense. Some products in the healthcare industry are not going to generate income. That's just a simple fact. There will be a deficit, things such as EpiPens, for example. But Mylan produces way more products in the healthcare market than just EpiPens. They aren't going to sink if their EpiPen market runs in the red for two years. I can guarantee you that. Now, that's not a practical, it's not practical in capitalistic structures at all to say that. I can absolutely grant you it. But this is why I think more and more that a single payer healthcare system might be our best option because it seems like when you're able to set the market with a government structure, it's a more controlled market, and people can jack the prices, but only if it's a specialty product. You can't have something that's been the same product since 2013, like the EpiPen, uh, become something that's jacked in 400% increases simply because it's becoming a more marketable product. That's that's price gouging. Senator Richard Brum- I'm sorry, Senator Richard Blumenthal dismissed Mylan's change as a PR fix, saying, "Quote." This step seems like a PR fix more than a real remedy, masking as an exorbitant and callous price hike. This baby step should be followed by actual robust action, the Connecticut Democrat had said. And Blumenthal went on, goes on to say, The only fair and effective relief is a substantial price reduction for everyone who needs access to this life-saving drug, not just a special break for people who are in a particular health plan and have the extra hours in their workday to navigate a bureaucratic labyrinth of discounts. I will continue to push for a federal investigation and congressional action. Senator Chuck Grassley also said Thursday that those changes don't address the big issues. He said, quote, The announcement today doesn't appear to change the product price. The price is what Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance companies pay. It's what patients who don't get assistance cards pay. The Iowa Republican said in this statement, he continued, And when the drug companies offer patient assistance cards, it's usually not clear how many patients benefit. Grassley had written Bresch earlier in the week, requesting information about the reason behind the price increase. On Thursday, Grassley said he was still seeking answers from Mylan. Senator Amy Klobuchar, hopefully I didn't slaughter that name, of Minnesota, is a Democrat whose daughter relies on the EpiPen, and she urged the Senate Judiciary Committee earlier this week to investigate the price increase of the medication, calling it unjustified. EpiPen costs soars. So... Klobuchar is in, on CNN, and she's voicing her concerns for parents whose children have allergies and want action. We can play that uh, video clip now, please. We've seen these prices creep up and up every single year uh, for so many drugs, and this is just the latest glaring example. And I think this really hits home because so many parents uh, buy these EpiPens for their children. Uh, my own daughter's 21. She carries one everywhere. And you have to get several of them. You may lose one. You replace them. And they actually 
actually reach their expiration date in one year, so then you have to buy more. And what this company's done is taken a product that in 2009 uh, was about 100 bucks and moved it up to this year between 500 and 600 dollars, which is not at all the price it's charged in places like Canada where it's hundreds of dollars less, um, nor does it reflect any significant changes in this product. I do want to read you the company's response to CNN. This is their statement. With changes in the health care insurance landscape, an increasing number of people and families are enrolled in high deductible health plans and deductible amounts continue to rise. So, so the, the company there basically putting this off uh, as a health care issue. Give me your response. Okay. Number one, the high deductibles are only showing consumers what this company has been doing. Before someone was paying for it, taxpayers were paying, uh, the government was paying, companies are paying. So when they jack up their prices, that price is being paid by someone. It's just more obvious to consumers because of these changes to the plan. So there's Senator Klobuchar on CNN talking about the EpiPen uh, price increase. And I thought that was a great point by her saying, well, the government's paying, other people are paying. So when this price range comes up and it's this obvious, it's just it's just more obvious for the consumers. Because it is very apparent that the EpiPen is something that people need. It's not an optional thing to have if you have severe uh, allergic reactions to anything. You must have the EpiPen. So... The idea that we can't have it around or have it more accessible like it was before is just a little bit ridiculous, and the, we can do it in an economic sense. If they were drawing a profit in 2013 for the cost of the EpiPen and they've made more of them, you can still draw the same profit from every single uh, EpiPen that you're creating that's more than your original amount. So you're still making a profit every time. Whether your shipping costs have increased because you're shipping more – you should have covered that in the original price of an EpiPen. This is how this works. You you manage all those prices and do the single. So this idea that the EpiPen price had to go this high because we have some debunked government system is just – it's absolutely false. The fact that we have kind of a quasi-private, quasi-public system, that's the reason why we have this issue. And again, Senator Klobuchar's daughter is not in a position to avoid paying for an EpiPen. This isn't like choosing not to purchase oranges at the grocery store. And obviously, Mylan is going to use the easy out and say that the government's involvement is the main issue with their price increase. And again, this is probably why a single-payer system makes more sense than this quasi-public and quasi-private system that we have now. The, in the insurance industry isn't tanking, folks. They're making a lot of money working in a market where the government is punishing people for not being involved in it. That's a big market. But they're setting up prices and they're setting of prices is what's, tit what's tilting the scales. Other first world nations use the government in a responsible way to set prices directly in the healthcare market. That change alone would bring competition to pr the private sector for specialty products and the base product cost would stay the same. So basically what I'm saying is maybe the government should get more involved in regulating these prices, laying them out for everyone to understand them more clearly, and Love keeping a base price for base Join products. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. Welcome back to 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, Paleo Radio here in affiliation with Secular Media Group. Again, my name is Joe Elder. Italy earthquake, the death toll passes 240 as the rescue efforts continue. This is out of BBC.com. Dozens of people are believed trapped in a ruined Amatrice, Accumuli, and Pescara del Tronto in central Italy. The 6.2 magnitude quake hit at 3.36 in the morning on Wednesday, 100 kilometers or 65 miles northeast of Rome. There have been hundreds of aftershocks since the quake struck, hampering relief efforts and damaging already unstable buildings. Now, this is if you guys have not seen this, please, please get in and just uh, look up Google the Italian earthquakes and just see the level of devastation that it caused. I mean, we're talking mass scale. It, it, it looks like old World War II videos of buildings that got destroyed by firebombing. I mean, it's absolutely crushed. And the the scale of of the rebuild is just immense here. So just I want to give people the scope and the idea. At least 80% of some of these cities, especially Amatrice, is absolutely flattened. 
Um, they have drone footage of before and after videos of what the buildings look like and what the the town looked like before the earthquake and after, and it's just um, shocking. BBC's Jenny Hill says, More than 4,300 rescuers are using heavy machinery in their bare hands. Rescuers have advised journalists and bystanders to leave Amatrice urgently as, quote, the town is crumbling. Many of the earthquake's victims were children, the health minister had said, and there were warnings that the toll could rise further. We have a video. Um, this is a CNN special reporter in Amatrice. Um, it is uh, pretty intense, and he's just going to give us a, a quick background on that. CNN senior international correspondent Frederick Pleiken. He's right in the middle of it near the epicenter in Amatrice. Fred, a big question here is how many people are still missing to give us a sense of how wh- and whether the death toll could rise? Mm-hmm. Well, the Italian authorities, Jim, certainly believe that the death toll can still rise and will still rise. And they say that they believe that there still could be uh, quite a few people actually buried underneath the rubble, possibly trapped underneath the rubble. However, they also say they can't really put a number on it. And the reason for that is, of course, that this is a tourist region. And they believe that many people may have been here visiting their families when this earthquake struck. Of course, none of them really registered here when this disaster unfolded. And at the same time, it also happened in the very early morning hours when these people were asleep. And so they basically had no chance to escape. Now, throughout the day, you're absolutely right. We have seen the rescue efforts here intensify. Uh, The crews have been bringing in more heavy equipment, but it is those aftershocks that just keep making life so difficult for the crews here on the ground. We experienced one that was quite scary, actually, when a lot of buildings here started uh, shaking, the ground was trembling, and there was one building that had already been damaged by the original earthquake that just absolutely crumbled, and the rescue workers who were nearby, all of them had to evacuate that area immediately. It took about half an hour before they could start again, so they are working under very, very difficult circumstances, and at this point in time, they're not really finding many people alive under the rubble anymore. However, it's those stories like the one you just showed, that little 10-year-old girl that really keep morale high, keep these guys going. They're, they're in for another very, very long night as they're continuing to work, but they say they're not letting up until they've gone through this entire area. Of course, Amatrice, the town that by far is the hardest hit of the 250 people who are known to have died in this disaster, more than 190 were killed here, Jim. So again, uh, the another CNN reporter in uh, Amatrice, uh, the heaviest death toll there, 184 people officially uh, have been confirmed dead. Another 46 have died in Arcata and 11 in Akumoli. A former and further 264 people have been treated in the hospital. Officials revised down the number of the dead and the earlier figure, giving the figure to about 247 total right now. But again, uh, this the cleanup effort and the rescue effort has just begun. It's only a couple days in so far, and uh, there is a lot of work to do. Rescuers said that they had pulled five bodies from the ruins of the Hotel Roma in Amatrice. As many, of se- as, many as 70 tourists were staying at the hotel when the quake struck. Many are feared to be in the rubble. Several of them were pulled out and given medical care. Late on Wednesday, there were cheers in the village of Bescara del, T- del Tronto when a young girl was pulled alive from the rubble after being trapped for 17 hours. Almost all the houses there had collapsed, the mayor had said. And the mayor of Amatrice said three-quarters of the town had been destroyed and no building was safe for habitation. The country is no stranger to earthquakes. The 2009 La Quilla tremor killed more than 300 people, and in May 2012, two tremors nine days apart killed more than 20 people in the northern Emiliana Romana region. So why the Italy quake was so severe? This is a uh, New York Times article, and it basically is breaking down why, why is this happening? Why can you see a 6.2 magnitude earthquake absolutely flat in the city? And I know a lot of people kind of shrug and say, what do you mean? Well, you know, in Nepal, there was one that I believe was a 8, 8.0 or even a little higher, and that one had less damage. So there's, there's a couple factors here, and the New York Times article breaks it down. Again, why the Italy quake was so severe, this is by Dan Bilefsky and Henry Fountain. The combination of a shallow fault and an old unreinforced masonry building led to the widespread dem- devastation in the earthquake that struck central Italy early Wednesday. Like other villages and towns in the mountainous area, Amatrice, where the mayor lamented that half the town no longer exists, has stone churches and other buildings that were constructed centuries ago when little, if anything, was known about earthquakes. Unless they have been reinforced in recent years, such structures are easily damaged or destroyed by the shaking. Quote, even a hundred years ago, 
They didn't know how to build the structures to withstand earthquakes. And this is David Rothery, the professor of the planetary geosciences at the Open University in Milton Keynes, England. The earthquake was less powerful than many recent deadly quakes. The magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck in Nepal, that's what I was mentioning, in April 2015, for instance, killing 8,000 people. Released roughly 250 times more energy. But the Italian quake was very shallow, and according to the U.S. Geological Survey, it occurred about six miles below the surface. Shallow earthquakes cause more de destruction than deep earthquakes because the shallowness of the source makes the ground shaking at the surface worse, which is just physically obvious that we understand that. This is what Professor Rothery said. Earthquakes are set off by the movement of the Earth's crust, which is divided into large sections called the tectonic plates. The Apennine Mountains, where the quake occurred on Wednesday, are in an area where one plate, the African, is moving under the, another, the Eurasian. Because of the complex interaction between the plates, the basin of the Tyrrhean Sea off Italy's west coast is spreading. And in this spreading and the tension that it creates in the Apennines has led to the quake. The area of Wednesday's Trembler experienced significant earthquakes in the past, including one with a magnitude 6.3 near the town of Lakia in 2009 that killed 295 people. And it injured more than 1,000 and left 50, 55,000 homeless. So, obviously, this is something that is, is common in Italy. And I know that everybody gets a kind of shrug in their mind, but it, it is worth saying that with the changing planet, things that became more mild become a little bit more stressed. It's not necessarily that you're going to see you know, crazy huge superstorms come out of the blue, but where you've already seen storms occur, you know that they're going to occur in more frequency or they could occur um, a little bit more powerful. So that being said, it makes me think of something like Oklahoma. When, when we have climate change that's disrupting our planet's basic rhythms and you have the whole entire tornado alley that already has tornadoes there in the first place, what you're going to see is more increased frequency of power with those with those tornadoes. The storms that already are occurring are going to occur more strongly, I guess I would say. And the earthquake is not necessarily tied to climate change, but it is worth saying that tectonic plate shifting and the Earth's warming there is there is a correlation that you could draw there. It's not uh, factually set, so I don't want to be setting someone off on the wrong plane to say that science has proven this. But it's it's a plausible explanation, I think. Same same way as it's plausible to assume that there's going to be sea level rise when ice melts from off land and goes into the ocean. So this is a, a really really devastating event that's happened in in Italy, and I think the big thing is, especially because it was a tourist area, it was something that people were preserving buildings that they knew were pretty faulty. And in this way, nature has kind of cre created a situation where, where it shows that they are the upper hand. Nature has the upper hand. And for tourist attractions and the idea that they're centuries old buildings, I understand the nostalgia there. And I understand the idea of wanting to keep them and, uh, and wanting to preserve them and, again, tourist attractions. People want to see these older buildings, um, the history that's behind them. But without putting the investment in reinforcement when you're in a tremor zone, eventually things like these can – these these type of things can absolutely happen. And it's it's devastating. But it is a reality that these – that Mother Nature is in control. And, you know, we're we're pretty smart. We're pretty smart for – being naked monkeys, naked apes. We're pretty clever, but we're not that clever, and we don't control everything. And, you know, it's kind of the same way as we can see a hurricane coming, but we can't necessarily stop the hurricane from hitting us in the shore, right? And so the only thing I would say is Italy needs to take this as a as a suggestion of other buildings or other old towns that have the same structures that Reinforcement needs to be made or at least investment in a cleanup that could eventually happen probably within the next 25 or 50 years as it's a very active fault. And like they said, the spreading of those tectonic plates is creating a lot of different action and tremors in those areas. So it's uh, something that they should continue to focus on. And I, I really feel for the people there. It said, again, 4,300 rescuers 
using heavy machinery in their bare hands to rescue people. And again, it's not like you can just lift heavy machinery and be pushing it all around. Um, it's it's not like you're going to be able to to push it all over and pick anybody out of that group. You have to do it by hand. It's got to be a long, tedious, arduous process. And that's the thing that we need to consider exactly like um like 9/11, you know, that was something where it it takes a long long time to get to people and to help people out. And so this is by no means over, it's by no means done with. Um it's going to continue and it's going to continue for a while. And who who knows? I mean, I I wonder if they're going to try to rebuild with the same type of structures that are reinforced to give a look back to how the city used to look or if they're going to try to rebuild in general. Uh, I don't know. But again, check out those photos, folks. It is, it's crazy what happened in Amatrice. Just absolutely crazy. It'll, it'll blow your mind. Like I said, again, it looks like uh, World War II. looks like a firebombing of their city. Um, ab- it's just almost entirely reduced to rubble. There, there were other buildings that fell in previous tremors that were reinforced that stood. So you do see a couple buildings that were standing. But for the most part, it's pretty flattened out. Stick around, guys. Next episode or next segment is going to be on the Aquatic Ape Theory, another pet project of mine. I think I can convince some of you. Uh, please stick around. It's going to be interesting. Paleo Radio. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. All right. Thank you guys for staying tuned. 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, WPRR, Grand Rapids. Joe Elder on the uh, line with you today. So I wanted to talk about the aquatic ape theory. Now, and I'm not talking about the airy-fairy fringe science aquatic ape theory. I'm talking about the thing that's backed by more people than you would know. It's actually pretty surprising. But there was a TED Talks. And it was by Elaine Morgan. And if you guys don't know who she is, she's someone who has now since passed. She passed in 2013, sadly. But she is a Welsh writer for the television for television, and has been the author of several books on evolutionary anthropology, especially the aquatic ape hypothesis. She authored The Descent of Woman, The Aquatic Ape, The Scars of Evolution, The Descent of the Child, The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis, and The Naked Darwinist, which was written in 2008. And these discuss the reception of the aquatic scenarios in the academic literature that surrounds her. She, al- she has also authored Falling Apart in Pinker's List in 2016. And she was named as one of the 50 greatest Welsh men and women of all time. So Elaine Morgan is a pretty acclaimed woman. And she did give a speech about the aquatic ape theory in TED Talks in a conference in 2009. And I want to break that speech down. But boy, I just want to give you guys an idea. And kind of set the framework for this. This is not about culture. This is not about, um, you know, uh, brain theory, brain power, and how we are different than animals in our cultural expectations and social norms. This is phenotypic, uh, looking at it in a nitty gritty way about selective pressures and the evolutionary, th- the evolutionary theory of Darwin and saying, why do humans look this way and apes and our closest ancestors look a completely different way? And what is the explanations behind that? And Elaine Morgan, I think, lays out a pretty strong uh, argument. We're going to lead in with her original one, which is that the savanna, the original theory is that we were tall, hairy, and on all fours when we climbed down from the trees in the savanna. And then we had to stand up to look over the trees or whatever the theory is. But data is showing that the savanna was not a desert as we assumed before. So I want to f- play the first clip, which is her just kind of giving the layout of the argument. It's the question of why are we so different from the chimpanzees? We get the genetists keeping on telling us how extremely closely we are, hardly any genes of difference, very, very closely related. And yet, when you look at the phenotypes, there's a chimp, there's a man. It's astoundingly different, no resemblance at all. I'm not talking about airy-fairy stuff, about culture or psychology or behavior. I'm talking about ground-based, nitty-gritty, measurable physical differences. There, that one is hairy and walking on four legs. That one is a naked biped. Why? I mean, (laughs) then, if I'm a good Darwinist, I've got to believe there's a reason for that. 
If we change so much, something must have happened. What happened? Now, 50 years ago, that was a laughably simple question. Everybody knew the answer. They knew what happened. The ancestors of the apes stayed in the trees. Our ancestors went out onto the plain. That explained everything. We had to get up on our legs to peer over the tall grass or to chase after animals or to free our hands for weapons. And we had got so overheated in the chase that we had to take off that fur coat and throw it away. Everybody knew that for generations. But then in the 90s, something began to unravel. The paleontologists themselves looked a bit more closely at the accompanying microfauna that lived in the same time and place as the hominids. And they weren't savannah species. And they looked at the herbivores, and they weren't savannah herbivores. And then they were so clever, they found a way to analyze fossilized pollen. Shock horror. The fossilized pollen was not of savannah vegetation. Some of it even came from lianas, those things that dangle in the middle of the jungle. So we're left with a situation where we know that our earliest ancestors were running around on four legs in the trees before the savannah ecosystem even came into existence. This is not something I've made up. It's not a minority theory. Everybody agrees with it. Professor Tobias came over from South Africa and spoke to University College London. He said, everything I've been telling you for the last 20 years, forget about it. It was wrong. We've got to go back to square one and start again. So again, Elaine Morgan talking about how the savannah was not originally a desert. Maybe at the time that we crossed and dropped down from the trees, or our, our ancestors did, that the savannah didn't look nearly the way that it does now. And the conditions and selective pressures that were around us at that time forced us to adapt and our bodies to adapt in a way that was different from other ancestors of ours. And I think that this is a it's a pretty legitimate theory. And again, backing what Morgan said, this is not um, a supposed theory that the savannah was different than it was around the time that we had gotten out of the trees and moved from the jungle out into the open plains. It was seriously a different uh, ecosystem, and with that, again, selective pressures change it. Now, in comes a guy by the name of Alistair Hardy, who is a marine biologist, and Elaine Morgan explains where he kind of gets the concept of thinking maybe human beings have been conditioned by water, and that's why we are or appear a little bit different than our ancestors. Alistair Hardy, a marine biologist, said, I think what happened, perhaps our ancestors had a more aquatic existence for some of the time. He kept it to himself for 30 years, but then the press got over and all hell broke loose. All his colleagues said, this is outrageous, you've exposed us to public ridicule. You must never do that again. And at that time, it became set in stone. The aquatic theory should be dumped with the UFOs and the Yetis as part of the lunatic fringe of science. Well, I don't think that. I think that Hardy had a lot going for him. I'd like to talk about just a handful of what have been called the hallmarks of mankind, the things that make us different from everybody else. So... Now Elaine Morgan gets into laying out kind of the reason why she believes that our bodies have been conditioned by water. And this is where I wanted to bring this in for you folks. This is some legitimate stuff. And this is why I think later on in the segment we get into why this is possibly true. But also who else believes this or is there anyone in respected medical fields or biology fields or anthropology that think this to be true and the answer will surprise you there but this is elaine morgan getting into our skin and why our skin is so much different than our other ancestors and also why it may have been conditioned by water hallmarks of mankind the things that make us different from everybody else and all our relatives let's look at the naked skin it's obvious that most of the things we think about that have lost their body hair, mammals with their body hair, are aquatic ones, like the gugong, the walrus, the dolphin, the hippopotamus, the manatee, and a couple of wallowers in mud like the um, babirusa. And you're tempted to think, well, perhaps 
could that be? Why were you naked? I suggested. The people said, no, no, no. Look, I mean, look over about the elephant. You've forgotten all about the elephant, haven't you? So back in 1982, I said, well, perhaps the elephant had an aquatic ancestor. Peals of merry laughter. That's crazy woman. She's off again. She'll say anything, would she? But by now, everybody agrees that the elephant had an aquatic ancestor. They've come round to agree that all those naked pachyderms had aquatic ancestors. The last stopout was the rhinoceros. Last year in Florida, they found extinct ancestors for the rhinoceros and said, seems to have spent most of its time in the water. So this is a close connection between nakedness and water. As an absolute connection, it only works one way. You can't say all aquatic animals um, are naked because look at the sea otter. But you can say that every animal that has become naked has been conditioned by water in its own lifetime or the lifetime of its ancestors I think this is significant. The only exception is the naked Somalian mole rat, which never puts its nose above the surface of the ground. So that's a a pretty legitimate claim, saying that there is a direct connection, and it's linear in one way, about nakedness in other species and their relationship with a common ancestor or previous ancestor that had an aquatic lifestyle. So I think there's something to that, and especially what she said there where not all aquatic animals are naked, for instance, like the sea otter, but all naked land animals do have an aquatic ancestor. The only exception is one animal that does not have its head above ground ever in its life. So there is a legitimate linear strategy to this saying that one way you can see that uh, we can be conditioned by our nakedness. Uh, The next one I want to play is how human beings have become bipedal and the relationship with that and water and also how our fat layers are different and more relative to an aquatic ancestor than other primates. Then take bipedality. Here you can't find anybody to compare it with um, because... We're the only animal that walks upright on two legs. But you can say this. All the apes and all the monkeys are capable of walking on two legs if they want to for a short time. There's only one circumstance in which they always, all of them, walk on two legs, and that is when they're wading through water. Do you think that's significant? David Attenborough thinks it's significant as the possible beginning of our bipedalism. Look at the fat layer. We have got under our skin a layer of fat all over. Nothing in the least like that in any other primate. Why should it be there? Well, they do know that if you look at other aquatic mammals, the fat that in normal land animals is deposited inside the body wall, around the kidneys and the intestines and so on, has started to migrate to the outside and spread out in a layer inside the skin. In the whale, it's complete. No fat inside at all, all in blubber outside. We cannot avoid the suspicion that in our case, it started to happen. We have got skin lined with this layer. If the only possible explanation of why humans, if they're very unlucky, can become grossly obese in, in a way that would be totally impossible for any other primate, physically impossible. Something very odd about our fat layer, never explained. So again, the fat layers, which is, I think, one of the the biggest amounts of evidence or the the most uh, valid portions of evidence, is looking at our fat layers and how human beings, unlike other primates, we do carry our fat layer between the skin and our muscle. And other other primates have that interwoven between, in which, like she said, only human beings can become as obese as they as they are because of this difference. And again, it shows a direct relationship to uh, having been conditioned by a water environment. Uh, the next one we're going to get into is conscious control of our breath and a streamlined body for being in water. The question of why we can speak. We can speak and the, and the gorilla can't speak. Why? Nothing to do with his teeth or his tongue or his lungs or anything like that. Purely to do... Uh, with its conscious control of its breath. You can't even train a a gorilla to say, ah, on request. The only creatures that have got conscious control of their breath are the diving animals and the diving birds. It was an absolute precondition for our being able to speak. And then again, there's the fact that we are streamlined. 
Try to imagine a diver diving into water, hardly makes a splash. Try to imagine a gorilla performing the same maneuver. And you can see that compared with gorilla, we are halfway to being shaped like a fish. And again, conscious control of the breath, I think, is the most legitimate one. That's what creates our language where we're able to take things that we see or experience or things that aren't seen right now and describe them in a way or an utterance out of our voice that makes others understand what it is. The birthplace of language came from conscious control of our breath. So, I mean, that is a very, very legitimate point. I think something that's worth considering. The very next one is how... There is some evidence here, and Elaine Morgan drives it home, that this is not a fringe science, and it has been misconstrued. I'm trying to suggest that for 40-odd years, this aquatic idea has been miscategorized as lunatic fringe, and it is not lunatic fringe. And the ironic thing about it is that they are not staving off the aquatic theory to protect a theory of their own, which they're all agreed on and they love. There is nothing there. They're staving off the aquatic theory to protect a vacuum. Now then. So she's talking about how there is actually no, no theory as to why the phenotypes of a human being and a chimpanzee are so different. And aquatic, ear, aquatic ape theory does fill that void. It says, here's, here's what we see in other species that are outside of humans. Here's what we see in how when they've been conditioned by water, they change. Conscious control of the breath, moving of the flat, fat layer, um, becoming naked, not having the hair. There's, there's plenty of, different reasons again uh for bipedalism there's only one situation when apes do all stand up it's when they're waiting in water and i think there's just a lot of evidence that she's driving home to show there's legitimacy to this and just looking at the phenotypes of species and the phenotypes of apes and what that looks like a uh, very last clip i want to play before we go into the break is who thinks this is true is there anyone significant and elaine morgan covers that as well i ask people sometimes and they say well of course i like the aquatic theory Everybody likes the aquatic theory. Of course, they don't believe it, but they like it. <laughs> Why do you think it's rubbish? They say, well, everybody I talk to says it's rubbish, and they can't all be wrong, can they? The answer to that, loud and clear, is yes, they can all be wrong. History is strewn with occasions when we've all got it wrong. <laughs> And if you've got a scientific problem like that, you can't solve it by holding a head count and saying, more of us say yes and say no. <laughs> Apart from that, some of the heads count more than others. Some of them have come over. There was Professor Tobias, he's come over. Daniel Dennett, he's come over. Sir David Attenborough, he's come over. Anybody else out there? Come on in. <laughs> the water's lovely. <laughs> So that's really good company to be in. You know, Daniel Dennett, David Attenborough, Elaine Morgan, people who have looked into this, especially David Attenborough, who is a very, very respected man across the world and what he's done in the realms of nature and human beings and their interactions with the world. Up next, we're going to talk about Turkey invading Syria, as well as maybe getting a call from a special, special friend. Stick around, guys. Paleo Radio will return. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. Welcome back to Paleo Radio, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM. Here in studio in Grand Rapids, we have a special guest on the line, Mr. Jeremiah Bannister. How are you, sir? It's true. It's the one and only, the Paleo crowd with a capital P. It's me. Look at you returning. How are you? <laughs> well, returning with a gusto, bro. Yeah, I'm, man. Uh, it's actually, I'm, seated, I'm seated here in the shade right outside of uh, Tin Folk's Soul Food Barbecue Catering. Wow. And I got myself some beef brisket. We have some pulled pork. I'm right outside Nashville, Tennessee. We were on a Team Tiny Dance for Forever retreat. We went down to uh, North Carolina. We spent some time on the beach over there near the Atlantic. We went 
to uh, a beautiful house, largest house in all of the United States, owned by the Vanderbilt uh, family estate. Yeah, we, we talked there. about that. T- tell us more about that. That's pretty crazy. Uh, it's like 250 rooms. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. And, and for, for point of reference, uh, George Harrison from the Beatles, his castle, uh, it's this beautiful, huge castle, has 120 rooms. And so I encourage people, go look up George Harrison's home. And then multiply that times two, Gee, and geez. that's what you have. It's on about four hundred and thirty plus acres of land, a beautiful landscape. They had a landscape artist come in who planted different kinds of trees from all over the place, and so you have this wildly diverse array of uh, trees and shrubbery and everything else. It's absolutely gorgeous. And inside, you know, you go on this tour and you you have a little audio thing you listen to in each room, and uh, they had a, a billiard. A billiard room in there that was just gorgeous. They had wow. a bowling alley inside their house. Of course. And the, and the bowling pins were, were made, and the whole thing was made by Brunswick, the same people who do the table. Hmm. And they had a swimming pool. And the way, that they, the way it worked was that they brought water down from the mountain, from the springs, but it was so cold. And so what they had to do is they had these steam pipes that warmed it up. Uh, and then they had lights at the bottom, and they were one of the, the very first pools in the United States to have lighting uh, inside the pool itself. And so it's, it's just the whole thing was gorgeous. Every room was different. You know, wow. it, was, it, was, it was just, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's the most amazing house I've ever been in. Yeah. And driving around, they have, a, they have a garden that goes with it. And by a garden, I mean, it, it's probably the size, or it's uh, uh, at least a rival there to Meyer Frederick Garden. Um, and so it's, it's, I'll tell you, the whole thing was great. And then we made our way to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. We've got a really dear friend of ours, a, a person who flew from Nashville to Michigan to be at Samantha's funeral. And about a week later, uh, he had a stroke, and he's, he's only 35 years old. And so we, a very dear friend of our family, and as we're driving, we said, you know what, let's just stop and just enjoy some time with him and just, you know, shower love on this guy and let him know how important and special he is to our hearts. And so we sat around, and he's really into music, but he has no, as far as I know, I don't think he's got a single CD or CD player in his whole home. Instead, he has record players everywhere. He's got like three or four in his home. And so we just, we we put on vinyls, man. He had this special collection uh, set of Beatles albums. It was like a $300 set. There's only about 10,000 made. It comes with a, a commemorative book uh, with every album they made and pictures with them. And so we just sat around and talked and enjoyed the storms and the lightning. It was, it was just it was gorgeous. And so we're on our way home. We'll be home. We originally planned to be home tonight, but we'll actually be home tomorrow. Uh, and then, big, big announcement, and then either the end of the... Well, I guess it is the end of this month. So beginning in September... I'm going to be back on Paleo Radio, my friend. Yes, we'll get back to our regular format, the one that we uh, used to have with the two of us pre-recorded, correct? Yeah, and we're going to be in a new the new office at the house, because we've been recording in the uh, the studio up in the attic, but for anyone who's actually been there, it's <laughs> basically like a hobbit room, you know. It's, <laughs> it's made for people about our height, you know, yeah. not too tall. You can't be like 5'11 and walk in there without ducking your head. Yes, And so it works for people like us, but we want it to be more inviting so that we can have people who are a little taller uh, <laughs> come yeah. in and, and, it's and also, enjoy the space. It's also an A-frame building, so you can you can stand straight up in the middle, but if you go to the left or the right in the room, you're hitting an angled uh, ceiling. So, yeah, it's it's a little bit hard to maneuver, you would say. And so now it's going to be downstairs. Actually, people who've been following the show for a while... Uh, and the, the freaks and geeks that go back to our Google Hangout days when we were doing that, you, Joe, you were situated in the room yes. uh, that is now the office. And everybody loved that because you had that glowing, romantic-looking uh, light It was an ambiance. <laughs> it was <laughs> an ambiance. It was be- a beautiful thing, yes. We're trying to capture yeah. that again with the show, right? Keep, yeah, keep we're that pristine. Yeah, we got to keep it pristine. I mean, it's just that's the way we roll. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, yeah. it was great for you to call in. I appreciate hearing from you, and it is awesome news uh, again that Jeremiah is going to be coming back uh, in the middle or or start of September, which is coming very quickly. So that's great news. 
Yep, the kids. I mean, we had a lot going on, obviously. I mean, Samantha died last month. Um, mm-hmm. And I haven't been on radio to talk about this. In fact, that's the first time I've said that on radio. Um, but Samantha died uh, last month. It's just over a month now. And the the last 30 days, I've been calling it the Great Fog. You know, it's it's been really hard. You, you go days and don't realize what day it is, what date it is. Did I take a shower or change my clothes? I mean, that stuff's what real. What did I eat? The, right. What did you eat? You know, and, and you go through this. And I, we needed, as a family, as a family unit, we needed to get away. North Carolina was perfect. You know, we got to hang out with, of course, uh, Greg Vining and John. They're involved with Paleo Radio. Yep, great uh, And they've been involved with Team Tiny Dancer, as well as, uh, people like Jenica and Patrick Crail, they're involved with Dogma Debate and Deja. And we had, uh, of course, Bobby Jillian. and Ashley from No Religion Required. Jillian, she was the hostess. It was in her home, her and Greg's home. And so there was a whole bunch of people and a handful of kids and a bunch of dogs. We had three dogs, including our very large nine-month-old St. Bernard. <laughs> and so we needed that. And just honestly, I feel like that, that fog has kind of gone away. And now it's a lot of sunshine. There's occasional sprinkles. You know, I mean, you still cry. And, I mean, just this morning I, I got on Facebook and there's a man, a friend of ours, who uh, has a small picture of Samantha and he knew that she wanted her make-a-wish. She wanted to go to South Korea. That was actually her second choice. And he went over there. Uh, he's over there for different reasons. And he took a picture of her and brought it with him and is taking pictures of her <laughs> in different places around South Korea, so it's like she's kind of there, yeah. you know, and, and so you go online, you see these things, you see people posting in the great stories and stuff, and I've got a lot of things to say about that on my Facebook page, and so if you're not following me, uh, I encourage people to do it, but I'm, I'm excited, Joe. I, I'm literally chomping at the bit, and Nathan, Nathan can suck that one right up, because it's not champing, it's chomping. Oh and yeah, <laughs> it's chomping oh, at the bit, Nathan Feniston, Nathan, Nathan Dufin. I'm so sorry. Just to give people <laughs> a background on this, the the amount of conversations that occur between Jeremiah and Nathan and myself, they're extensive and they're long. They're usually like three hour conversations, very in good fun. But then we get into certain uh, schisms, <laughs> like is it chomping or champing at the bit, and then we have to go yeah. solve it with Google machine. You know, yeah, and do all the, that. the Google gods, the yep. Google gods have the answer. But, I, you know, I started reading articles again. Actually, it's been within the last week that I just I went back on Twitter and looked at the news feed. I went back online. I checked out my sources. I started reading these things again. And, and actually just being able to process them again and not feel like everything's kind of slurring and blurring in the mind. And so it, it's exciting to, to know that I'm dispositionally in a place where I'm able to approach that microphone again because, man, Joe, I love Paleo Radio. I love our, I love our audience. Uh, I love the freaks and geeks, man, and I love you, brother. I love you I too, love you man. I, I'm really happy you're going to be coming back. It, it's great news. I think it's great news for everybody. And like we said, we're going to be delivering the same format, the same style show, everything that you guys know and love. Absolutely. So I got hey I gotta eat my beef brisket before it gets cold. Yeah, do but do I, that. Yeah. I'll do our sign off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my man. Yep, tons of love, everybody. I can't wait to uh, I'll be back in September and enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, thank you very much, JB. We'll catch you later. All right, guys. This has been Paleo Radio. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry you couldn't get to Turkey and Syria. We will absolutely cover it next week. Um, it is a serious issue. We just kind of got sidetracked with uh, having that lovely call. But stick around. Love you guys. See you next week. Secular Media Group.